everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. I am joined here today by Keeper Trout. How are you today? I'm doing great. Yourself? Good. Beautiful, sunny day here in Colorado. How's the weather out there in NorCal? Uh, here it's beautiful. It's overcast, uh, <clears throat> but there won't be, we won't be having rain for another few days. Oh, gorgeous. And I assume this is your rainy season? Uh, hopefully. I mean, you know, from, from like October until spring is the only time of year we typically get any rain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So today um, we want to chat about your involvement with um, the Shulgans, the Shulgan Foundation and Farm, what's going on there. But first, before we do that, I want to talk about you and your work. Um, okay. Sure. <laughs> great. So um, I... I guess largely, from what I understand, you're a real pro around cactus cultivation and um, taxonomy. Or, or Is that right, or am I far off base there? Um, I, I have a, a longstanding interest in cactus and an interest in the taxonomy of them, but it's also a mess, and it has been since its beginning. Mm. So... Uh, I, I, I hesitate to consider myself an expert because I think the entire field is a mess. And I'd hate to say I was an expert in a mess. Um, <laughs> well, I love that. So um, I guess, uh, is it is it a very typical scenario? Like people are just kind of like uh, doing infighting or is it like... Um... No, the, the biggest problem is that... Um, we have this uh, thing about professional respect and respecting people bef because they're professionals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, respect is a good thing. But one of the problems is that in the early days of cactus collection, it was essentially a sport for kings. And, you know, if you weren't incredibly wealthy, you didn't own cacti. Yeah. Because, you know, people basically went and collected them for you so you could show off with, you know, other people of your status that, you know, you had this cactus that they did not. Um, one of them was actually named uh, after Lukenberg. It was named Lukenbergia Principis, it's namely Lukenberg's principal, because he had spent so mu much money sending somebody out to find it. Uh, but what that meant is it wasn't really a scientific endeavor. You know, people were, you know, like hiding their localities because they didn't want other people to go collect it. And a lot of the early descriptions were basically crap. Uh, things would be described with no known points of origin, never having seen a flower. And even even like when you uh, come across Trichocerius Peruvianus being named by Britton and Rose years later, you know, like many years later, they described it as, quote, probably having a large white flower. What? So they actually put the thing into print as a described plant, never having seen it flower. And so when these descriptions get respected because they were written by an authority, um, it really leads to some problems, you know, or when people like Kurt Backberg get involved and, you know, just names things as new species based on trivial differences, it creates a real morass that's hard to resolve, especially when you have a set of descriptions of different species with no real identifiers that can differentiate them. And so it's, it's the grandfathering of really shoddy early research is what's created the mess. And it, it really, and it is a mess. I mean, it's a horrific mess. And actually, in my opinion, this might sound silly, maybe you already know it, but one of our big problems in taxonomy is there is, in plants anyway, there is no definition of the base unit species. You know, there's, there is no definition people agree on, on what makes something a species or what makes it a subspecies or something else. And you would think that having a clean definition of your primary uh, unit of categorization would be a place to start. <laughs> uh, and I, I once asked Myron Kimnack this question, and he just laughed at me and said, you know, he didn't know how a person could come up with such a thing, you know, which isn't real promising. 
But then I pointed out zoology has such a concept, which is that if two, if two animals can breed together and reproduce offspring that is fertile, then they're a single species. And Myron just looked at me, and I swear his words were, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> so, so that, there's anyway, uh, but that's why I'm not, I'm just not hopeful. And <laughs> now it's moving into molecular taxonomy, which can be argued that those types of cladistics are more meaningful. But, you know, even there, you have to decide what's meaningful as comparators. And so they're actually, it's not as neat and clean and divorced from human opinion as it might seem. Um, so anyway, I, I like understanding what I'm looking at. Uh, but there's one other confounding factor around cactus, which is there's been so much intensive hybridization that's been occurring for some decades now. And many of these plants have grown up and they're now producing their own seed. So there's hybrids coming off of hybrids. And anytime people don't keep track of these, you have a plant that there really is no way to actually identify. And so I believe we're in the, the last of the era where we can go out and look at an unknown plant and with some confidence say we think we know what it is. Oh, I, I believe wow. that's pretty much ending. That's uh, it's fascinating, a bit troubling, but also interesting. And um, yeah, I'm glad I asked about cactus. This is, it's fascinating. Good label. The mushroom thing is not that it's a... Perhaps oh, it's because just, the it's, aristocrats it's weren't in there as much. Oh, you think it's worse? No, it's it's, it's it, it or it has been worse mm -hmm. because so many things have been named that actually aren't separate species. Mm. You know, uh, Alan Rockefeller has been doing a lot of good work uh, collapsing those. You know, based on molecular work, but collapsing a lot of you know pre-existing names into being one single thing instead of you know two to five. Mm -hmm. And so, so there is good work going on. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's just there's this odd thing, you know, when you respect and tolerate bad work because you respected the person responsible for it, you're actually preserving errors. And that's, uh, that's problematic. I mean, if you actually want to be understanding something, you want to be ferreting out errors, not respecting them based on the person. And this isn't like a novel thing. Like you can find mycorrhiza spelled two different ways, you know, with one R or with two R's. And that's because it's supposed to have two R's. But the problem is in coining names like that, if it comes from a respected authority and they make a typo, their typo is respected. And that's how we got mycorrhiza with one R. Mm. is because it was put into print by a respected authority. And so now both spellings are considered correct. Oh, wow. So to get people kind of clued in a little bit more about you and your history here. So how, how did you start bumping into the Shulgans? How did you start getting engaged in their world? Um, in the early 90s, I went to a plant conference, a botanical preservation course seminar on Maui. And that's where I met Anne and Sasha and uh, a whole bunch of other people who were, you know, continue to be friends and uh, even collaborators. I mean, it was, you know, possibly one of the most important events that I've ever gone to. I mean, that was when and how I started writing um, at the urging of Sasha and Bob Wallace, you know, both of them were urging me to start writing, and which I did. Because you know, prior to that, all my interests, which stretch back decades, were just personal and private. You know, I had no, I, no idea, you know, I should be writing because it just didn't seem sane since everything was illegal. I mean, even on that event, I didn't know what I was going into. It seemed just uh, too over the top to be real. You know, you had not just Anne and Sasha, but Albert Hoffman was supposed to be there. Uh, Richard Evan Schultes was there, Dennis McKenna, Dale Pendell, the Jonathan Ott, one person after another. And it just seemed, you know, 
so, so much too good to be true that I went there with a week of food and a water purifier in my pack in case, in case I felt I just needed to flee. Mm. But as it was, it was wondrous. <laughs> That's brilliant. And um, so you were able to engage with a lot of these folks and, and they inspired you to write? Is that what you're suggesting? Oh, very, very much so. Mm -hmm. And also I really hit it off with uh, multiple people, especially, you know, Anne and Sasha. You know, it was, uh, they were just, some of the most delightful people I'd ever, ever met, you know, uh, I'd been managing to dodge photos and I turned around just in time to see Anne snapping a photo of the side of my face and to which she said, oh, never mind. I just have to collect these photos for my CIA overlords, uh, to which uh, Sasha said, not everybody knows you're joking, <laughs> and, but it was just so endearing, you know, that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's yeah. We it it was it was marvelous getting to meet them there. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. And then then we stayed in touch over the years. But so, and how I came to get involved with this thing at the farm was Sasha had been you know he knew I had interest in cacti and was writing about them, so he was urging me to come and f go through his full his files and see if he had something that I didn't. And I just procrastinated and procrastinated until finally at one point, you know, Sasha was basically on his way out and Tanya's just urging me saying, you have to come by and complete this because we have no idea what's going to be happening. And so when, when Earth heard that I was, did, was scanning the mescaline uh, folders, you know, there's two drawers of files, um, he suggested that Arrowwood would pay me for doing this as long as if they were provided with digital copies, you know, because they were involved in archiving the Shulgin archives at that point, too. Um, and then it just, you know, once I was done with those, it just kept expanding and uh, went on to me di first digitizing, uh, Sasha, you know, all of Sasha's files in his office and then moving into the barn and digitizing all of the files that were there. And that's essentially complete now. You know, I think it was uh, eight, year, eight years of effort. Um, but it's a done deal. We're now assigning metadata, so it's actually indexed. It'll be indexed and accessible. You know, but the first thing, obviously, is protecting people's privacy. Because, you know, there's lots of personal letters, and we have the responsibility for making sure that stays private. So that's what we're working on now is assigning metadata so it can be clear what needs to be redacted before it becomes a public archive, you know, which is the end goal, is making everything possible in the archives available to the public. You know, bearing in mind you know, what I just said about you know, the importance of privacy concerns and respecting people's privacy. So there's the way, the way I envision it is that there's essentially two archives that are going to come into existence. The first one will be the, the one where private information is redacted, and some things won't even be able to be made available just because of privacy concerns. Then the other one isn't for us. It's for the future and for a different time when you know, all of the people and their children and grandchildren are dead and gone, and nobody's going to care who did what when. At that point, the whole archive can become available to the public. But you know, right now, that's just not a possibility. Mm. That sounds but like it's, it, extraordinary. It's exciting, though. Yeah, yeah. It's it, and the the documents that are in there is it's just it's mind boggling. I've never experienced anything like this because it's. Its organization is a little peculiar in that it's organized around projects and molecules. And so, you know, Sasha wouldn't just collect papers, you know, scientific papers. There'll be, you know, personal writings and correspondence about individual molecules. But there will also, also be newspaper clippings, magazine articles. Um, he was trying to capture everything possible 
about the social impact and societal responses to each one of these molecules from one molecule or one class of molecules point of view at a time. And I think this, originally, this part of the project originally started with Nina, Sasha's first wife, as far as you know, the social impact side of things and this massive collection of newspaper clippings and uh, just pretty much everything you can imagine. I mean, it's right you know, conference, conferences, conference notes, correspondence around conferences. Uh, it's a rich treasure trove of information. Mm. And did you have experience doing any kind of archival work before that, or did you just jump in? Well, only, only my own crazy... Uh, world of being an information junkie. You know, I've been uh, just uh, obsessed with this area, oh gosh, since the late 70s, you know, in terms of being serious about, you know, acquiring information. I mean, I actually picked, started becoming interested in it as a teenager in 1973. Well, I guess 72, but 73 was really the year I, everything took off for me. Yeah, you know, seventy-two. I was still trying to figure out uh, how to get off on cannabis. Mm -hmm. you know, how to in, well, how to learn learning how to inhale. Um, <laughs> yeah. So LS, LSD worked fine, but you know it's uh, I don't know. It's just uh, it's been a long-standing interest. You know, with but that was my main interest is in information is. It's a little, it might sound a little weird, but my intersection with information databases and libraries um, is almost metaphysical. You know, it's information finds me. You know, if I'm interested in something, it's almost like the universe conspires to put that information in front of me. <clears throat> and all I have to do is just be open to that. Um, but it's it's a very peculiar and sometimes humbling process, just how extreme that can be. Um, so I, you know, I refer to it as the library muses because it seems like there's something associated with library systems that feeds me with information. And it's not just libraries, you know. It's uh, you know, it's like with uh, what I do with the Cactus Conservation Institute. Um, I'm fairly well informed, but it's not because I go out and seek out the information. It's the information seeks me out. Um, and so I, I view myself as just sort of a, a node, you know, it's, so I, I don't understand, I don't understand it, but I really enjoy it because it seems like what I'm suited, it's what I'm suited to do. Mm. Yeah, that's super interesting. So I guess let's talk about psychedelics because without psychedelics, it probably would be the case that the connection with Sasha and Ian would, would have been quite different. So you said um, LSD, like what what was attracting you to psychedelics um, in the early days? Oh, gracious, uh, bad hype. <laughs> I mean, that was, uh, you know, my, my first interest in uh, trying LSD happened in third grade. I think it was either third or fourth grade. They showed us this movie called D25 in school where, you know, somebody went to some seedy little drug deal in a darkened alley and scored a sugar cube. Yeah, and then they went home and, you know, took it and they were turning into monsters and demons and, you know, having this really horrific time and, uh, you know, got in their car the next day after they were down and hallucin and had a flashback that they were... Uh, airline pilot and drove off an overpass and died. And all I could think was, this is such a load of crap. There's no way anything could do that to somebody. But it left me just really interested. Like, I, want, I wanted to learn more. Um, I mean, that's one of the dangers of advertising. You know, I'm sure you know, you've noticed historically that once MDMA... Um, went into these hearings about scheduling and became illegal, interest in it exploded, absolutely exploded, as did the use of it. 
And this seems to be the pattern. The more you can interest people in it, especially if you're trying to scare them away from it, and especially if they're young people and you're trying to scare them away from it, um, it's very likely to have exactly the opposite impact. I mean, it's, I think it's human nature, you know, especially when you're a kid, you know, you rapidly learn that it's the things adults are telling you not to do that are the, the things that are interesting and fun. You know, so I, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just, uh, but that was what intrigued me. And then once I actually tasted LSD, um, that really intrigued me. You know, it was, uh, for me, a very valuable experience. And I totally fell in love with it. And so I, I like mescaline too, but, you know, frankly, you know, some people will badmouth LSD, but it's possibly the single most important psychedelic that's actually happened because of the number of people who've used it worldwide and have had that experience. You know, it sort of laid the groundwork for everything else that's happened since then. You know, it's, it's just, uh, you know, and it was also Sasha's favorite molecule. Mm. What do you think it is about LSD that, that people like to badmouth it? It's threatening because it's inherently, and this is true of all of these molecules, whether a person wants to view them this way or not, they're inherently spiritual experiences, and that's at the core of it. And when people have trouble with it, it's usually because, you know, there are, you know, say if a person has mental, mental challenges, they can run into trouble. But the main reason most people run into trouble with it is because they have deeply seated religious beliefs, and what they're experiencing with the psychedelic is threatening that or conflicting it. This was one of the reasons why LSD was attacked so viciously in the 1960s was Timothy Leary and others were trying to actually create a church founded around the base of LSD as a sacrament. And this is something that, you know, Christianity has fought since the beginning, you know, whether you're talking in Rome or whether you're talking modern times or whether you're talking, you know, the Spanish, the Spanish coming into Mexico, wherever, you know, established Christianity has encountered intact psychedelic using religions, it's attempted to exterminate or obliterate them. You know, here and and I don't believe that it's any accident or a coincidence that if you look at the religion, the religion, the psychedelic religions that are respected by the law, Native American Church, Uniao de Vegetal, and Santo Daimes, every one of them is perceived of as a Christian organization. And I would suggest if they were viewed as strictly pagan organizations, you know, as some Native American church chapters are, um, they would not have had that respect and they would not have enjoyed that protection in the courts. I, I think that's, you know, that might sound cynical, but it's really hard to draw any other conclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that was, that was one of the motivations why LSD was targeted was because it was recognized, you know, early on. And you can find this even in the scientific literature that people are in fact having what can only be termed of as spiritual experiences, you know, for good or bad. I mean, you know, I really enjoyed a wisecrack Timothy Leary made years ago that I'm probably going to mangle, but he made a comment. He said that, you know, if good people take psychedelics and make religions, they'll be good religions. If bad people take psychedelics and make religions, they'll be bad. Re they'll be bad religions. And if crackpots take psychedelic, well, they'll be crackpot religions. And that is sort of what we what we've seen happen. You know, we have, in fact, seen some wacky religions come into being or attempting to come into being. Um, but I'm not sure religion is necessarily the right word, you know, because religion tends to be something organized and tends to have structure and dogma. 
And much of what we experience with these molecules would probably be better referred to as spirituality, you know, because I'm certainly uh, have no interest in converting anybody to believe like I do. You know, it's, uh, it, it's, this is one of these strange things. You know, if you look at drug abuse as a disease model, you know, where as many people would uh, present it, the only real, what, or should I say, what best, the addiction that best fits the disease model is religion, is organized religion. You know, people basically interact with it as if it is a drug for them. And they're really motivated to share their disease with other people by converting them to their religion. Hmm. That's fascinating. And I'm not slamming Christianity in that, but there is, there also is some truth in this. You know, it's one of the reasons that psychedelics have been attacked is because they don't permit the control that, you know, organized Christianity wants over its faithful. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, um, I remember some, some interesting line about, uh, mystics being mystics being un inherently ungovernable and this, um, psychedelic experiences can, um, often create mystics <laughs> And, well, that's mm -hmm. probably what they do best. Right. And it's that lack of controllability that is both good and problematic because it depends on the individual. You know, if, if it's a good person, it's one thing. But if it's somebody who's, you know, like some evil control oriented person, um, the outcome won't be good. You know, because psychedelics, you know, if you, if you take, say, if you take LSD, what you've accomplished is you've taken LSD. It hasn't made you a better person. It hasn't made you a worse person. It hasn't done anything except give you this experience. And what you keep out of that is actually based on what you put into it and what you do after the fact to actually bring something back that you own. Because the one thing that drug use really has an, as an advantage over a lot of religious practices is drugs have a duration. They wear off. You take a drug, you know, six, eight, 10 hours later, you're sober again. You know, uh, unfortunately, when people go off in some thing that's not drug induced, um, you don't know how long it's going to take to wear off. It may never wear off if it's powerful enough for the individual. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, do you think there's anything around, um, LSD being unnatural that people react to, um, like, uh, versus being a, a plant sourced thing? Sure. But that's, that's a fallacy. I mean, I really liked, I, I really liked, uh, Sasha's comment some years ago that I'm sure I'm going to mangle where he was pointing out, you know, that, while a plant, you know, might be a natural organism that's making an alkaloid, the chemist is also a natural organism that's making alkaloids, you know. And so it's, it, it, I think Andrew Weil was the one that uh, was promoting this on the basis that it helped confer some sense of safety due to having a his, long history of use. But there, there have been... Uh, quite a few molecules now that have seen a long history of use. And it's absolutely clear, not all of these, even natural ones, are safe. You know, psilocybes isn't safe. You know, it's, uh, you have, you know, in, increased pressor effects when you take psilocybin. And if you're, say, an older person with heart issues, you know, doing a large dose of psilocybin could actually be harmful to you. You know, and so... I don't, I believe it's a red herring, but I also believe that it's primarily being employed because of political purposes. You know, it's easier to convince the powers that be that we should be allowed to use substances that have a long safety record rather than something that's new and might not have that. But in reality, if you're looking at toxicology of things, it's really hard to prove something safe. 
you know, especially in this area, because it's not so much about physical harm, but, you know, if somebody, you know, has some mental challenges, you know, say, you know, they're a latent schizophrenic, they could in fact have that schizophrenia become manifest, you know, at, in the course of their experimentation with psychedelics. And so, you know, these types of things do need to have some awareness, you know, but it's not whether it's natural or synthetic that's uh, what does it. You know, I, I, I think that's a red herring, but I think it's being used for political advantages right now because it's effective, because legislators can understand and think in those terms. And whether it's real or whether it's not real isn't the issue here. This is, you know, a game of chess that's being played where people are seeing the long, the long run goal of having things be legal. And it's being done piece by piece, you know, which is part of the problem. And something I should clarify is I actually am not a proponent of legalization or decriminalization. I think they're both really wrong-minded paths. And this is something, this is why we're experiencing what we're experiencing, which is that every step of each one of these of this uh, process has to be repeated for each molecule, one by one. Because what's really at stake isn't being addressed. You know, we're asking for permissive permission to being able to use, say, psilocybin or, uh, you know, mescaline or ketamine or whatever it is that, you know, the practitioners are seeking permission to be using. And it doesn't change the picture. You know, if people really wanted to see, you know, positive controls, they would do what we did with alcohol. Alcohol was never legalized. You know, prohibition was repealed. And those are two very different things. The repeal of prohibition judges the law, not the drug. Decriminalization and legalization are just the opposite. They judge the drug, not the law, and they accept Congress's right to tell us what we can and cannot do with regards to entering a relationship with a substance or a plant. And that's the core of the problem, is that we do not need permission. These things were always legal. They do not need to be legalized. What needs to happen is the Controlled Substances Act needs to be repealed in the same way the Volstead Act was repealed. And all of these substances need to be made legally available in known quality and known quantity. This is what happened in Portland where they made everything, you know, technically legal for the user, but with no quality control on the industry so that you've got fentanyl deaths out the wazoo. You know, what needs to be happening with this is getting over this idea that somehow there's this immorality around drugs. You know, if you want control, illegalization is the way that you lose control. I mean, it's the same, you know, we're witnessing the same thing that happened with prohibition, except with drugs. And it's on steroids because of, uh, because of the picture, and especially now with fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just, uh, there's this weird idea that somehow legislation has the capacity for controlling appetite, as Abraham Lincoln uh, once alluded to. And it, it doesn't. I appreciate that nuance. I, I typically say things along the lines of decriminalization is a nice baby step. But I mean, when I say decriminalization, I mean all drug decriminalization. Like this, this concept of the CSA is not a helpful concept. I think even uh, Dr. Carl Hart from Columbia is proposing that we abolish the Controlled Substances Act. Um, and when I talk about legalization, I mean all drug legalization and safe supply in the way that you kind of talked about it there. And I've um, not really ever heard it discussed that the CSA would be the thing that we would need to abolish to get there. But I think that's right. I think that's a it really right-headed way to think about this. 
Yeah. yeah, it is. But there's one thing that comes with that, and that's why this isn't on the table for discussion. And that's, it ends the DEA. Mm. And that's a, not just a bunch of powerful people, but it's a bunch of powerful people's income. You know, and it's not a small amount of money because it's not their budget. The DEA brings in far more money through forfeitures and asset seizures than their entire budget combined. And that can't be factored into their budget. And so they will fight tooth and claw to keep things the way that they are. Yeah, but this is, this is the problem with this picture is it has perverse incentives. You know, and it's the population that actually gets harmed. You know, it's, 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 it's a vexing problem because most people don't have the ability to understand the larger picture, not because they're dumb, but because they don't have the right pieces of information or they have a understanding of it that's flawed in terms of what they see. You know, one of the biggest problems with decriminalization and legalization as paths is they aren't simply baby steps. They're possibly the only steps. Because what, hap what happens, we live in a common law system. Congress, I would suggest, imposed religious restrictions when they were fighting drugs. And this didn't happen, start with the Controlled Substances Act. This, you know, in the 1800s, there was what was referred to as a temperance movement. And what a lot of people miss about this is the temperance movement wasn't after alcohol, or wasn't after heroin, or wasn't after cocaine. It was after everything. You know, all of those drugs, plus chocolate, coffee, tea, tobacco, uh, Yopon, fly agaric, Catha edulis, all of these things were being talked about in the late 1800s as needing to go away. But the way that it was set up in the courts, they had to do it one drug at a time. You know, and so they started you know, with opiates and cocaine. Then they got alcohol. Then later they got cannabis. And then you know, later you know, they added in more, you know, more controls and restrictions on things like amphetamines, barbiturates. Then finally, you know, we end up you know, several decades later with the Controlled Substances Act. <clears throat> which has just been exploding with, you know, the compounds that are being added to it. But the danger <clears throat> when you have legalization and decriminalization as your paths is since we live in a common law system, the acceptance of these laws grants authority to Congress because we're respecting their authority to having made those laws. That's the biggest danger with decriminalization and legalization is it's transferring its recognized authority to Congress that they have illegally taken. So furthering the fallacy of authority in a sense. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. Um, when you talk, Oh shit, this is a tough one. So I guess when we're, when I talk about legalization, I mean that people have access to a safe, regulated supply. And I don't necessarily mean some sort of highly regulated system like we have in cannabis today or perhaps in psilocybin in Oregon, which is like a highly regulated, highly legal framework. Like mm -hmm. I, I assume like the cannabis framework that we see today and the framework we have in Oregon are kind of what you're talking about when you're mentioning legalization. Is, is that right? Well, right. Right. Compared to what happened with alcohol, where alcohol did not experience legalization, it experienced repeal of the prohibition. Mm. And that's created a very different picture. It's created a regulated picture with quality control and known products and availability, but it didn't come with this Wild West scrambling act for people to try to get every bit of profit from every angle they could during the period when regulation was being poorly imp implemented or even only partially existing. 
It's, you know, it's this mad rush for the cash for entrepreneurs that comes with decriminalization and legalization that does not come with repeal. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the big differences. Right. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm watching carefully what's happening in Colorado and I, my, my, my general sense is that people want to, to relive the cannabis gold rush again via psychedelics and through multiple mm -hmm. waves of psychedelic, uh, I guess, legalization, as opposed to, I like, I like your framing. I have to, I have to massage the language for myself and come up with a way to mean it, but I'm, I'm very on board with this because I, I call it like the overly regulated model. And it's obvious, like it's, think about ancient Rome. Like this is how people were lobbying senators and it's, it's not all that different, right? It's like, let's no, get laws not. in place. We're going to manipulate and, and do whatever we can to get our way. So we make the most cash here, which, you know, it's America, you know, we're not exactly not Ro the Roman empire, but like, it's, um, it's an interesting scenario that we're having to play out here. Um, and I'm, I'm generally with you that, yeah, we, if we, if we take a look at like the natural rights, if we, if we go back to like the framers of the constitution and their use of like a natural law and things like that. Yeah. Like we're, we're God's animals on the planet. We should be able to do what we choose with our bodies and with nature and things we interact with. And the chemist, again, the lab, the chemist operating lab is also part of nature um, and also the product. So, yeah, I, I'm with you on that. It's still a very, it's still a messy picture, you know, simply because you have so many different layers of how people approach things and how people believe in things. You know, it's just, it's one of the challenges that we have in our society in general. You know, it even, you know, is why we have such problem with homelessness, <clears throat> for example. You know, if you want federal assistance <clears throat> or even state assistance, say with, uh, if you're homeless, you have to prove you're one, trying to get a job or have a job. <clears throat> Two, you have to demonstrate that you're not using alcohol and you're not using drugs. And the reality is, if all of the homeless people were capable of demonstrating those three features, I would suggest they wouldn't be homeless. Mm. And so what this meritocracy approach to assist assistance for people who are deemed in need of assistance uh, does is it truncates it where most people that really need the assistance the most don't get it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And... It's this moralizing where you have to prove you're worthy for anybody to care that sort of sets up the, the whole system for failure. Mm -hmm. Right. So I want to pivot in talking about um, the farm and the Shulgans a little more. And you, you had some interesting things before we started rolling about um, how the people don't really understand the project and how collaborative the project is. But can you, can you speak overall about what, what is happening at the farm? Well, what's happening right now is it's being, you know, transferred into the, uh, into the ownership of the Shulgin found Shulgin farm or Shulgin foundation. And what the hope is, is that this is going to become a community resource that can actually be used, you know, for gathering, for, you know, uh, people getting together for therapy sessions. But what actually is going to happen is going to depend on the collaborators, because much of this is a blank slate where the desire is to actually serve as a resource for the psychedelic community. And what that's going to require is people being involved. But the people involved are going to create the face and the shape of what happens, you know, because this is there's so many different facets um, in the world of psychedelics. It's not, you know, one set of interests. It's actually a very broad set of interests. You, you have people who are interested in new molecules, not simply psychedelics, but, you know, molecules for actually helping people's health and well-being. You know, and then, you, of course, you have, you know, the people of interest in psychotherapy. You have people who are interested in, in just getting together and networking with other like-minded people. 
You know, and then there's also plans for expanding the ethnobotanical garden there. You know, so there's a lot of things going on in parallel. And what actually is the outcome is going to be shaped by the people who get involved and participate. And that's exciting. Yeah, that's gorgeous. And um, how do you like to describe the property if you're talking to somebody who hasn't been there? Um, a bit funky. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a, you know, it was a, the remnants of a farm that Sasha's parents bought many years ago. And his lab got built, you know, and the remnants of uh, <laughs> after their house burned down. And, you know, the house itself was built, you know, hand built by Sasha and his father. And so it's a, it's a, there's been lots of revisions ongoing for things like, you know, electrical and plumbing and, you know, the septic system. And, you know, because it, it was a working facility. You know, it wasn't something that was uh, basically made for entertaining the public. Um, but, you know, at this point, you know, all of those revisions are being done because it's important to have, you know, safe electricity and uh, water, you know, water piping you can rely on. You know, it's, those aren't optional things when you get, you know, uh, you want your toilets to flush. You know, it, uh, it so... That's what's happening now is, you know, just getting the infrastructure up to speed, you know, because when, you know, when Anne and Sasha were still alive, this wasn't actually of importance. You know, this was their home and people would come and gather there for things like, you know, East Easter or uh, around Halloween. But now it's seeing a lot more use in regular gatherings. And so the facilities, you know, correspondingly need to be upgraded. And so that's what's ongoing. Mm. I've had uh, the opportunity to visit twice so far. I love it. It's always so great to visit. I'm sure you've been there at least oh, yeah. three and times. It's, um, and it's a, it's a slice of paradise in the middle of, you know, the East Bay. You know, it's just... Uh, it's really idyllic there in terms of, you know, it's almost like a nature sanctuary because of, you know, all the development around there sort of forces, you know, the birds and animals to enjoy the quiet spots, you know, one of which is the Shulgin farm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. There's so much beautiful nature there and really great wildlife. So, um, has has Peter Vitale tapped you with any kind of official responsibilities? Peter Vitale is, uh, for those who don't know, is one of the main ringleaders at the foundation trying to move this project forward. Um, really, he's putting a gigantic amount of energy in, but has he tapped you with any kind of uh, responsibility uh, here? Infor informally, yes, and formally, yes. Um, I'm currently the secretary of the board you know, it's, uh, you know, when, Wendy uh, Tucker and Maria Mangini uh, and me are the board, are currently the board members, um, which, which is exciting. You know, it's uh, good people to be working with, you know, just very, very dear friends I've known for a long time. So that's pretty marvelous. I mean, just getting to work with either or both of them is pretty marvelous. Yeah, I finally had the opportunity to meet both of them at the farm last time I was out a month or two ago. And it was so great. I've been meaning to meet Maria for a long time, but uh, really also lovely to interact with Wendy. Um, so it's really, mm -hmm. really great that you're uh, involved so deeply. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's where my heart's at. <laughs> um, what do you think it is about the Shulgin legacy largely that attracts us all to it? Personally, especially if people knew, you know, I think some of it is people not knowing, you know, that they're not connected, but the people who actually have been connected and actually knew Ann and Sasha, I think one of the primary things that attracted them was their openness and inclusiveness. You know, uh, 
Sasha would hear anybody out. He would talk with anybody. And he wouldn't prioritize if somebody came up who, you know, thought highly of themselves because they had a PhD or this program or that program and tried talking over somebody who was just a, in their mind, just a regular person and their inferior, Sasha would focus on the person he was talking with. You know, he wouldn't put up with that because he really loved and respected individuals for being individuals. And even if he was uncomfortable with a, a person, he would still be polite and still be respectful and still give them his time. You know, it was, um, it was a very unique thing. You know, they both Anne and Sasha made you made at least, you know, from my, my impression and my experience, they made you feel welcomed. And I mean, genuinely, you know, not just superficially. And I think that's something a lot of people encounter really rarely in life is for people who are actually genuine and have a lot of personal integrity. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, you know, it's just, we live in some strange times right now. <laughs> and it's just, uh, we sure it seems do. Like, it seems like narcissism and being unwilling to listen to anybody's opinion that you disagree with is the norm. And, you know, those are like failing paths. You know, there's no good future in those. It's just a bunch of people arguing and shouting at each other. And it's, it's just, it's sad. It's, it's just sad. So we're hoping that something more positive is going to grow out of this. But I think that's the operative word is this is a project that's growing and how it's going to grow is going to be shaped by the participants. That's the most important thing, I think, for people to understand is that the future of the farm could well be what they want it to be. And how can people figure out how to get involved here? Uh, show up, <laughs> talk with Peter, get signed up on the lists. Um, you know, there's regular work parties they can sh uh, sign up for. You know, because that'll enable them to meet, you know, meet more people and understand what's happening. As it's moving forward, there's going to be more committees being created around projects that are going to require more people mm. uh, as you know participants. Yeah. And so, if they're connected in with that, then they'll be learning about all of these things as they're happening. Amazing. But that that's the best. The best thing is just get involved however they can and. Uh, Think about what what they want to see, and talk with Peter. You know, just uh, ask his ask his opinions on what's the best way to accomplish what they're they're hoping. <laughs> well, um, I think that's all the time we have for now, Trout. I really appreciate you coming on, and I, I hope we can do more. Um, I would love to dig into your uh, psychedelic cactus knowledge base at some point. Um, which happy I'm, to, oh, beautiful. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for listening. And, um, until next time. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Joe. <laughs>